Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So today we have another set of interpreting information questions that we're going to be going through. So um, let's get straight into it. And um, thank you so much for 3000 subscribers. Um, so this is recorded a couple of days early, but we've just hit 3000 subscribers. But thank you so much. I genuinely can't believe it. Um, such a massive, massive milestone. And um, hopefully that we've been able to help out quite a lot of people this summer. And as ever, when you guys are doing your UCATs and once you finish, please do let me know how they got, how they went. Um, and I look forward to hearing back. Okay, so let's get straight into this one. Then. So from 1996 to 2001, the American drug giant Purdue Pharma held more than 40 national pain management symposia, hosting thousands of American doctors and pharmacists with the aim to draw them into the promotional material about OxyContin. So Purdue Pharma misrepresented the harmless of their harmlessness of their product to medical professionals. Okay, so I can see all of this is true so far, except for the harmlessness of the product bit. Like we haven't heard anything like that yet. So let's keep reading. The semi-synthetic opioid loosely related to morphine and originally based on elements of the opium poppy was aggressively marketed. Okay, as a non-addictive chronic pain remedy. So non-addictive misrepresents them. Okay, this could be true. Let's keep going. So overprescribed due to numerous incentives, OxyContin became a go-to drug for any kind of pain, but many addicts abused it by grinding the pills up to snort for a potent high. Okay, so it says here, if the addicts abused it, then it must have been an addictive substance. And it says it was marketed as non-addictive. So this must be true. Okay, um, so American doctors and pharmacists were bullied into prescribing OxyContin. Well, it says over here that it was overprescribed due to numerous incentives. And all it says about the American doctors and pharmacists here is it says they, the, the aim was to drill into them promotional material about OxyContin. Okay, they weren't actually forced into doing it. OK, so um, this one, there's not quite enough inference you can make. This bullied is a bit too far. OK, so that's why it's no. Oxycontin started out as a part organic drug for persistent pain. OK, so it says it was um, over here. Um, where was it? So it says it was based on elements of the opium poppy. It's obviously organic. Um, and for persistent pain, it says and marketed as a non chronic pain remedy. So I would say this is true. So once again, the key things that we're looking for are these kind of synonyms as such. So claims of OxyContin's non-addictiveness was the main reason for it being prescribed more often than necessary. Okay, so with this one, so this is one of the classic, classic kind of uh, tricks you can't fall for. So here it says it was always prescribed due to numerous incentives. And just before you know, it talked about the non-addictiveness marketing idea. But the point is, it never says that was the main reason. It says, it literally says here, there were numerous incentives for why it was overprescribed, but it doesn't say this is the main one. So th these kind of classic questions where, yes, they talk about the non-addictiveness, specifically in the past, and they don't talk about the other kind of reasons. But that doesn't necessarily mean it was the non-addictiveness specifically, um, which is why it was prescribed more often than necessary. Okay, so this is going to be no. And patients are to partially blame um, for the escalation of the opioid problem. So if we have a look here, it says many addicts abused it by grinding the pills up to snort for a potent high, fueling an opioid epidemic. So opioid epidemic, opioid problem. So you can see there's a direct link as such here. Okay. And it says here the addicts abused it and they ground the pills up for a potent high. So I would say that this is probably true, that patients are partially to blame for the escalation um, of this opioid problem. Okay, so yeah, I'd put yes, no, yes, no, yes. Okay, great. So on to the next question then. Okay, so a Frenchman who suffered burns across 95% of his body has been saved by skin transplants from his identical twin. Okay, skin's plasticity was partly credited for the success of the transplant. So nearly half of his brother's skin was removed and stretched in a machine so it would cover a large area. So the plasticity idea. OK, so I potentially say that this is true so far, but I'd probably keep reading, I'll be honest, um, just in case it mentions something else later. So it says transplants from an identical twin, which have been done before, but never over such a large area, eliminate the risk of rejection by the recipient's body. So here this kind of confirms it. it says it's never been done over such a large area. And it says here about the skin was used to stretch over such a large area. So I would say that this is true. The plasticity was, you know, is, is partly credited. Um, this would be different if it says skin's plasticity was only credited for the success of transplant. Well, that's wrong here because it says right here about how transplants from identical twins remove the risk of rejection. So transplanting organs from close relatives removes the risk of rejection. Well, the point here is, once again, it's here it says about identical twins, but close relative isn't doesn't necessarily mean identical twins. So I would say there's not enough information yet. OK, but let's just keep reading just a little bit in case they talk about close relatives later on. 
So, normal skin grafts from a deceased and unrelated donor are used, even though they are nearly always rejected within a couple of weeks. This is enough time for new skin to start growing. So, transplanting skins between twins was the world's first operation. Um, it doesn't say anything about that, um, because it says it had been done before, but just never over such a large area. Organ donors must be related to the victim through a transplant to be considered viable. It says here about deceased and unrelated donors, so this is also going to be no. Skin grafts on a recipient's body are rarely permanent. Well, this is where that last line. So you can see what I'm doing is it's not just a case of um, having to constantly keep rereading information. It's about trying to draw links with the info that I've already read. So skin grafts on a recipient's body are rarely permanent. There is enough time for new skin to start growing. OK, and it says here they are nearly always rejected within a couple of weeks. So this is probably going to be true. So the main idea is the grafts kind of act as a temporary stopgap whilst new skin can grow and replace okay so yes triple no yes that's what i got cool okay on to the next question then so priming suggests that when schemas units of information stored in our memory are activated in unison a connection is made between the two Okay, so this is probably an example of a passage I probably would have skipped. So if you guys haven't watched my decision-making strategy video, um, you can find it under my general UCAT guidance playlist where I talk about the decision-makings you should skip and why. Okay, and so this is one of the passages where I read and I kind of think, oh my days, this looks kind of challenging, right? And I don't really think I'll be able to process it well, so I'll just come back to it. Okay, but once again, for a more specific order on which questions I would do, if you check out that video, it explains it in a little bit more detail. So, semantic priming effects, though used widely in cognitive psychology, are transient nature. You can just tell by some of these statements that they just look quite challenging. So, semantic priming effects is what we're looking for. So, more simultaneous activations lead to stronger connections, resulting in quicker recall of two associated concepts. This enhanced connectivity results in a faster response to a stimulus based on prior exposure to a related stimulus. While in both, while in both semantic and perceptual priming, prior exposure to a word can potentially enable faster processing of a related word, the word association is more linguistic in the former. So it's more linguistic in semantic priming, okay? In perceptual priming, the association is with words with similar forms, like rhyming words. So here it says it's widely used in cognitive psychology are transient in nature. Um, I don't really think there's anything... It doesn't really mention anything about that. It talks about a faster response to a stimulus, but that's just in general. It doesn't say specifically about semantic priming, about semantic priming effects. So I would say no to this one. Once an association is made between two schemas in long-term memory, it is almost impossible to break it. Okay, so the point here is it says that, you know, more simultaneous activations lead to stronger connections, resulting in quicker recall. But I wouldn't say it's almost impossible to break. I don't really think it mentions um, breaking the associations. It says you can, you know, the more... Um, some of these activations you get the stronger connection you get but I don't really think there's much about um, the actual breaking so I'd say no for that one it's possible to manipulate the time a person takes to respond to a subsequent stimulus based on a prior stimulus well what did we just read so we said here more simultaneous activations lead to stronger connection so I would definitely say that this is true okay um, so more activations stronger connection means faster recall okay resulting in quicker recall of the two associated concepts the exposure to a prime pair is less likely to facilitate the recognition or processing of the word bed than the word fruit. Um, so, prior exposure to a word can potentially enable faster processing of a related word. The word is more linguistic in the former, so it's more, yeah. Okay, whereas, so it's basically saying with semantic, it's more linguistic, so it's to do with the actual word, I guess. Uh, whereas here it says it's associated with words in a similar form like rhyming words. OK, so I'd say that this one is probably true. So this one I'm not completely 100 percent sure on, but pear is more closer to fruit than I would have thought that it is to bed. OK, because pear and bed just, yeah, I guess in a way you can almost use a little bit of your common sense here as well, as well as obviously the information has to be in the passage, but you can use a little bit of your common sense here. Homophones, words that sound the same but have different spellings and meanings, have the potential to be associated in perceptual priming. Yes, because it says about similar form like rhyming words. So I would say that this is true, that last line. So you can see, so as you're reading as well, it's important to have that memory almost, right? So I'm not remembering every word, but it's just key ideas here and there. And even if you don't have that memory, like it really isn't the end of the world, you can always just, you know, go back and read it again, but it'll just take you a little bit longer. That's all it is. Okay, so yeah, let's keep going. So 
the lack of a list of to-do items and inability to schedule important jobs um, is most likely the reason why disorganised people often find themselves unaf- unable to fend off the temptation to postpone tasks to a later time. Okay, so the fear of failure is self-reinforcing. So it says, the fear of failure, and so I've read the first line already and I didn't find anything there, so I'm going to keep going. So the fear of failure is another reason that li- another reason that leads to avoidance and delay in performing tasks to an extent that the time period to perform lapses to perform lapses, and the procrastinator feels the ease of not having to deal with it anymore. Mounting tasks make them increasingly resigned to failure as they begin questioning their own ability to do things. Okay, so it says they kind of question their ability to do things as you have more things to do, which only happens because you're afraid of failing, so you don't do more things, and because you don't do more things, those things kind of build up. So you can see this is kind of like a, a cycle, basically. So because you're afraid of something, you don't do it, and because you have more things... And so because you don't do it, more things build up. And because more things build up, you begin questioning your ability to do those things. So I would say that this is true. It's a little bit more of a tricky one to think about. Um, but yeah, I would say that this is true. Procrastinators can be di- driven by fear. Um, yes. So here, the fear of failure is another reason that leads to avoidance and delay. Um, and it says, you know, the whole thing is talking about why disorganized people find themselves uh, um, unable to postpone tasks for uh, unable to fend off the temptation to postpone tasks for a later time. Procrastinators often seek perfection. Um, I don't remember reading anything about perfection here. I can have another quick glance at it, but I think it's most likely to be no. Disorganised people mostly fail to prioritise tasks. Well, it says here, diso- the lack of a list of to-do items and the in- inability to schedule important jobs is most likely the reason why disorganised people find themselves unable to fend off the temptation. So, mostly fail to prioritise tasks. Yes, inability to schedule important jobs. Okay. Um, procrastinators are organised yet fearful individuals. Well, it suggests that this is a reason, but it might it might not only be because they're fearful. Okay. Um, like yeah, I guess I guess yeah, I guess the fearful bit is more true than the organised bit. But there's nothing about the organised that's mentioned here. So this is one of those statements I was saying. You know, it's like it's almost like fifty percent true. So yeah, you could say that they are fearful, although they fearful in every case, not necessarily. Um, you could have like a minority of people that are just procrastinators because they really just can't be bothered to do something, as opposed to the fear of failing, I guess. Um, but the point here is, even if this bit was true, there's, we're not told anything about this bit. So if it's like 50% true, 50% false, or 50% true, and 50% unknown, it still has to go down as a no. Okay? So yes, yes, no, yes, no. Okay? Great. So I hope that this video was useful. Uh, I know a couple of people um, requested me to put out this video, and I hope that this is useful in your upcoming UCAT prep. And and as always, please do continue to comment, like, share and subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next video.